Um, then we're going to move to chapter 11, the pile fabrics. And so like a brocade, woven pile fabrics incorporate an additional woven element in and between the warp and the weft that form the ground cloth. So here are some just our basic plain weaves that we looked at, plain, satin, and twill. So when we talk about a pile having that third element, it has both the warp and weft yarns plus this third element that creates these loops that can then either be cut or left as a loop. The pile, meaning the raised area, is brought to the surface and it's so densely packed, not like it's showing here. This is kind of just an enlargement. It's so densely packed that it becomes a raised surface. In most pile fabrics, the ground, meaning this base, the warp and weft, is only seen from the back. So this was traditionally made, um, historically used as well. And it, today it's mechanized. mechanized. But how do you think they did this in the Renaissance? How did they make these loops all the same height to create beautiful velvets for the king? And how they did that was on the loom, they would have a, a dowel or a little brass or bar, like a metal bar. And that metal bar, as they were weaving, that metal bar that was right in between here would make all of those loops the same height. So one by one, they would create the pile. And if they wanted it to be cut, like, um, like in this example for a velvet, they actually had a little razor bait blade attached to their finger and each row, they would cut one by one. So I tell you that story because I always thought his velvet is kind of just being cut like mowing the lawn. Like <laughs> you had something that went over the fabric that cut it all nice and even. But to appreciate craftsmanship again, historically it was done around a dowel or a bar and then cut each individual pile at a time. So some examples of piles um, are in beginning in swatch number 70, uh, 91 in your book. So swatch 91 is an example of a terry cloth. And most of us are familiar with that term because it's what we use for our washcloths, our, our bath towels, etc. Um, if you are thinking about your bath towels or if you're looking at the samples, are the loops cut? or are the loops left in place? Um, Terry velour means that the loops are cut on one side for a more luxurious face and left unclothed on the back. So, new term. <laughs> this is a Terry cloth velour. So one side, the front, as Bobby pointed out, is cut, and one side on the back is left with the loops. Learn so much with you guys. We may have had a corduroy pants or corduroy jacket in our lifetime. <laughs> um, for interior designers, um, I use corduroy in like boys' rooms to kind of give it uh, the design custom bedding to give it kind of a, a little cool effect. Um, this is from a company, if you are interested in looking at, um, called, I might watch the name, Roche, Roche Bobois. Bobois. They're located in North Scottsdale, and they're an international company, R-O-C-H-E-B-O-B-O-I-S, I think. They are so innovative and contemporary and cool. They use corduroy in these neat sectional upholstery pieces, and their pieces mimic Something, they look like half mattresses, half sectionals, but they're just really fun. And so I've seen, you know, Pottery Barn Teen and Pottery Barn Kid kind of knock some of this off. Um, but they were the original. So number 92 and this is an example of a pile weave. It is a corduroy. 
and a corduroy is a cut pile. So it creates those channeling or vertical row effects by cutting that area shorter. Swatch 93 is velveteen. Uh, velveteen uses a third set of yarns as well to make loops on the surface of the fabric. The loops are sheared and napped and brushed to create a soft, plush surface. So what's the difference really between a velvet and a velveteen? So I put this little velveteen rabbit here. Turn of the century story, velveteen rabbit. And, you know, probably made of, of cotton, a pile that was soft and comfortable to make little stuffed animals out of. So it's typically used made out of cotton spun yarns, whereas velvet traditionally are filaments, meaning silk or something like polyester, synthetic nylon yarns, those long yarns that represent silk. So velveteen and then velvet. So velvet looms have cut, cut wires or metal rods which contain sharp blades to create that plush surface. I talked a little bit about how they did that traditionally. And so they cut the looms as, as each pick is woven. Velvet is a weave, it's a pile, and, and it traditionally it was made out of silk or wool or mohair, but it also can be made out of um, filament yarns such as you know polyester so it could it could even be a very fine rayon with to create that effect so velvet draperies so in arizona it's you know velvet draperies they, they if, if they're very fine they can be used as draperies they could be used as a light upholstery they could be used in some bedding and some pillows um but it's a, it's a little harder to get a nice drape out of some velvets, so you have to kind of feel the weight when you're specifying that as an interior designer. So I don't know, between samples 94 and 95, maybe. So that this is just from Pottery Barn, of course. There's a lot of upholstery fabrics in, um, uh, or draperies used, velvet draperies used in restoration hardware. Um, fit very well. They just don't fit very well in more you know, casual and rustic spaces. So number 95 is an example of crushed velvet. So crushed velvet adds an extra step in the finishing pro process, literally crushing the pile, literally crushing the raised surface of the velvet. Or it, la it lays it flat in one direction, and so it's catching light in different ways. So looking at sample number 95 and then the crushed velvet is, is helping uh, it catch the light in different ways. Be very careful when working with anything that has a pile and catches directional light. So for example, yeah, because I'm just going to use an example of number like a uh, uh, Number 95, let's say you were putting, you were using velvet to create a bedspread, which you wouldn't. And you, you, you have to put two pieces of velvet together. So if, if, you, if you look at most bedspreads, actually it's three. There's a big piece in the center and then two smaller ones on either side. That's usually how bedding is sewn together in three different pieces to cover a king bed. So if you change the direction of the velvet when you're sewing those together it looks terrible because it catches the light different so a pile has a direction and so turn them around so sometimes like if you have a navy blue fabric velvet and you're looking at it in one direction it looks black and you turn it around in the other direction it looks light blue so be very careful of the direction that you're working with when, when velvets go to your workroom. Just happens. 
<laughs> so that is um, there's all the different kinds of tight velvets, sculptured velvets. So I also don't like the examples number um, 97. I have to fix that. Numbers 97 in your swatch book um, of a grow point. So a grow point features all over surface texture created by pile loops. They're at, they actually are loops that look like little knots. They're literally raised to a point. So the sample in the book, swatch number 97, um, I mean, it is a grow point, but it's, it's not like what I normally see. This looks almost like a rug, a little rug or doormat, number 97. This is what a grow point fabric looks like. These little knots all in a row that cover the surface. And then they create all these wonderful traditional patterns. So typically a very traditional design, although I do see some contemporary grow points. So that is the end. I see I have to make a little bit of swatch adjustments to my, my 